Today is October 22nd, 2024. We are at the Community Media Center in Westminster, Maryland. My name is Steve Bowersox, and joining me today is Steve Whistler. Thank you for being with us today and sharing your story of service. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. All right, so you want to walk us through um, like where you grew up, why you went into the military in the first place? Do you want to kind of do a little backstory there? Sure. Yeah, I was born in um, actually Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, which is where Valley Forge is uh, on April 7th, 1968. And my father at the time was uh, in the Army as a military policeman. He um, got out of the military and we moved down to South Florida where I attended uh, grade school, middle school, and high school. And I graduated from Northeast High School in um, Oakland Park, Florida in 1986. And from there, I immediately uh, joined the Navy right out of high school and um, went to language school in Monterey, California. So when did you, how did you find out about the language school? Was there, did they come and recruit you for that or was it something you could sign up for? And also you might want to talk about what languages or language you Sure. Yeah. It's funny. When I was growing up in South Florida, you know, in those days you had encyclopedias. And one of the things I remember most as a kid is pulling out the encyclopedia with the letter I on it and looking at insignias. And I saw the military insignias. And I was really uh, enamored with the military, na you know, especially the Navy ranks. And um, so I, I decided long when I was a kid, you know, that I really would love to go into the Navy one day. And so I talked to a recruiter in my junior year of high school. Um, I was really lucky to, to be able to pick up science and math pretty quickly. And so I initially was going to go in as a nuclear um, technician. So I tested really high on the physics and mathematics stuff. But then they learned I was colorblind. And they were like, well, not a good idea to, <laughs> to put somebody uh, that's colorblind in that field. So then they said, well, what would you like to choose? And I said, well, let me be a linguist because they were offering language training didn't know what language I would go into at that time, uh, but I um, elected to be what's called a cryptologic technician interpreter or interpretive. Um, and so I went to, right into boot camp in Great, Great Lakes, uh, Illinois, uh, about a month after graduating in 1986. Um, and then they sent me to Monterey, California, where they offered me the choice to learn either Russian, um, uh, Persian Farsi, which is the language of Iran, or Arabic. And I chose the Persian Farsi language because of all the conflict going on at the time uh, in the in the Persian Gulf. Very good. I just going back a little bit. You said your father was in the army. Any conflict with him with you going into the navy? Was there any kind of family like anything? He was just happy you were serving. No, the no. He was just uh, really ecstatic that I wanted to go into the military. Um, my family had a long history of military service. I had uncles that were in the Marine Corps, Army. I think I might have been the first Navy person okay. to go in the Navy. All right, very good. Yeah. So you go to school and learn Farsi, this language, and at that time, I'm sure you were very much in demand for or anyone who could speak that language and interpret. So where did your journey go from there after you got out of school? Well, um, I went to the language school for a year, learning Farsi eight hours a day, five days a week for a whole year, which was pretty intense. And then I did a couple more schools um, over a three or four month period after that. And then I reported to my first duty station uh, at Fort Meade at the National Security Agency area there uh, in March of 1988. Okay, and that's what brought you to Maryland since you're a South Florida person. Right, and I've, I've had roots in Maryland ever since 1988. All right, very good. So you're at Fort Meade, but you're eventually going to end up overseas for much of your career, is that correct? Correct, yeah, I was assigned to a unit at Fort Meade um, where uh, we had, it was a group of probably 60, 70 linguists of, uh, of a variety of languages uh, in the Middle East, North Africa region. And we would go out to the Persian Gulf and ride ships or go on aircraft for six to nine months at a time. And so I reported there in March, I think my first tour of duty in the Persian Gulf was I want to say June or July, it's when I did my first tour out in the Persian Gulf. I cross-decked to, I would jump from ship to ship to ship. So as a ship would come in, I would ride it. And then when the ship would leave, a ship would come in to relieve it and I would jump over to that next ship. Um, and so it was a lot of fun um, tracking what adversaries were doing and making sure that 
the people in those ships, uh, riding in, in those aircraft and operating on the shore, that they had an idea of what the adversary or potential adversary might be doing. So did you look at um, written things that had been captured or were you listening to conversations or interrogating people? It was, a, it was a variety of ways and things and so, uh, but it was just, um, it was a really fun and exciting thing to do and um, it was, it was just so gratifying for me just knowing that I was helping protect um, uh, not just Navy, but a whole, ver you know, every single military person out there. And then also a, a lot of um, Department of Defense people, State Department people that were stationed throughout the region. Okay. Very good. And you also mentioned that you uh, did some work in airplanes also. I did, yeah. One of the assignments I had, um, it was during, it was actually during the time when we had conflict out there, when Saddam Hussein and Iraq invaded Kuwait. Um, they actually had me um, flying in um, airplanes and I was uh, again doing the mission in the air and um, I remember some of the planes that I was assigned to we were uh, people on the planes were counting the oil fires when the Iraqis lit the uh, oh. the uh, you know they they destroyed all of the oil terminals Kuwait. in Kuwait but we were counting the number of fires daily uh, we were also providing uh, indications and uh, not just visual but also audio of where the adversary might be, and so when we went into Kuwait and it, and ejected the Iraqi army out of Kuwait, we were it was just uh, fun being a big part of making sure that we not only got the enemy out of there, but we were helping protect our own comrades in the army. Very good. Was there any? Um, I mean, that's a very different way of life over there than what we're used to. Have any adjustments when you were overseas? Kind of getting used to anything? I mean, you've ruined ships, so maybe you were around mostly our guys anyhow, but. Yeah, well, I mean, on the ships, yeah, we were on um, on the water, um, uh, but uh, but when I was flying, we were stationed uh, in Bahrain, and so, um, you know, we were, and then you had Scud missiles flying also, you know, the Iraqis were launching missiles at Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, and I remember getting into the the bunkers to make sure that, you know, if the, if the missiles were coming in, that we were protected, um, but a little, and also, you know, the Iraqis had, aircraft and they occasionally sent aircraft after us and being on a P3 we didn't have any missiles to shoot back so we were relying <laughs> on um, carrier escorts and, and other airplanes stationed in Saudi Arabia to protect us while we were flying and there were some pretty close calls and um, there were two that I can recall where we wondered whether we were going to make it out but we did. Oh wow. And um, but yeah it was just a very very exciting time and something I'll never forget. I'll bet. Um, you had mentioned when we were speaking earlier about some commendations that you received. Do you want to talk about any of those things and what you were doing at the time to... Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, based on everything I described to you, especially during the airtime, <coughs> um, I was fortunate enough to be awarded the Combat Action Ribbon uh, because, again, you know, being in a combat area and, and also um, my efforts uh, along with so many others that we flew with was awarded the Air Medal as well. Um, also, a couple of other, com like the Navy Commendation Medal, and, uh, but again, just, there wasn't anything that I did uh, by myself because we all did it as a team, but, um, but yeah, it's just, um, it was, it's, it's nice walking away with an, an award, but what I walk away with and cherish the most are the, are the memories of what we did to make people safe and the friendships that I still have to this day. I was going to ask you, I wanted to know if you kept in touch with any of the guys or women that you served with. Absolutely. In fact, um, this past um, this past Friday, um, I think it was Friday, yeah, Friday, we, we actually had a reunion in Ashburn, Virginia oh, wow. of uh, a lot of the cryptologic officers and a lot of the cryptologic enlisted people uh, that I served with, not only out there in the Persian Gulf Theater, but also at many of the intelligence collection sites around the country. Um, but yeah, I, I, we met up with uh, about 100 and, 120 people um, from people that are later became admirals and, and leaders within the cryptologic industry, but it was just really nice connecting with them. That's great, that's really nice. So you were in the military for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And you obviously, you have very fond memories and it was a good thing for you to do. Would you encourage young people now to go into the military? Absolutely. You know, one of the reasons I went into the military was because I wanted to see the world. I mean, um, I didn't, um, uh, I, 
I wasn't ready to go to college right away. I, I uh, wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. I was, a, I was an okay student, CB student, um, but I just wanted to see the world. And me doing that gave me that opportunity. And I almost got out of the Navy, almost. Um, at five years, I almost got out, but then they dangled a $30,000 reenlistment bonus <laughs> if I were to stay in and keep serving as a linguist. And I'm really glad I did because I was later selected for a commissioning program a limited duty officer program. Um, so I did 10 years as an enlisted sailor and 10 years as an officer. And um, it's just the travel, um, the, uh, and then the post retirement benefits that you get. Um, it's, just, it's just a very unique experience and I encourage all of our, all of our um, young people to consider joining the military and serving their country. It's, it's something that you'll never forget and it's something that you'll always cherish. I, I think you're correct also there. Um, it sounds like you did, I mean, a lot of people go into the military and you do your four years or, or eight or whatever and then you're out, but you really took advantage of your time to get your education while you're there. You told me you got your associate's degree, you got a bachelor's degree, you got a master's degree and finished almost all my doctoral your doctor. Yeah, finished all my doctoral courses. Um, actually, I finished all of my doctoral courses um, a couple of years after I got out. Um, but I didn't finish the dissertation, which I reluctantly didn't, that life got in the way. Right. But, um, but yeah, I took advantage of all of the GI Bill benefits. I took advantage of the tuition assistance that you got while you were in the military. And um, yeah, I, while I was in the Navy, I got my associates, my bachelor's, my master's degree from Troy State University and completed all my doctoral coursework with the University of Phoenix. That's, that's really good. Mm -hmm. It's good to take advantage. Plus I also, um, did a second, worked towards a second master's degree with um, Johns Hopkins University School of Education. Again, did everything but the final project. Um, so, um, but yeah, just a, a lot of opportunities the military gives you, plus the post benefits, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the VA home loan guarantee, if you wanna buy a home, you can have no money down and purchase a home. Uh, and not to mention the health benefits, the healthcare benefits when you get out. Right. So after 20 years, that's how long you served, right? So 20 years, you could, were you able to, you could have stuck around if you wanted to for another, they were gonna offer you a chance to re-enlist or as an officer, I guess it's a little bit different. I did, I was, um, I was actually selected for Lieutenant Commander, which was 04. I retired officially as a Lieutenant in 03. Uh, I was selected for 04, but I refused it and retired. Um, couple of reasons. One, my kids were um, six and four at the time. Mm. So I wanted to make sure that they kind of had a stable uh, life and environment. Um, and I was fortunate I could do that. And then also I was very blessed in that um, a defense contractor offered me a position to be their East Coast Division Vice President. So um, just, uh, I figured that was the time to Okay, that's good. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask you what you did mm -hmm. immediately after or what your transition was. Sounds like it was pretty good, you know. Yeah, it was fortunate. I um, led a defense contractor uh, division for a couple of years. Um, I also, um, I, I then um, left that company and I became a teacher in uh, Baltimore County Public Schools where I taught full time in our public schools for about four years. Um, it was challenging to me because I was in an environment before teaching where everyone did what I told them to do. And then I went into an environment in the classroom where not everybody always does what you tell them to do. I totally understand. Um, so, and then Johns Hopkins offered me the opportunity to be their military liaison. And that's what I do today. I'm the military liaison and field services manager for Johns Hopkins. And you told me you are able to help out veterans uh, with who may not be aware of all the benefits that are out there for them. Right, yeah, right now in my role with Johns Hopkins, I'm so blessed to, to work alongside about 25 or 30 people where our, our, our entire mission is to go out and educate veterans on their health care benefits, their options, and my team and I, we do a lot more than just talk about health care, we talk about dental, we talk about vision, we talk about other um, education, VA, Veterans Administration benefits, and I'm so um, happy to partner with other Carroll County organizations like our Carroll County Veterans Independence Project where we help them and their staff uh, when they have people come in from Carroll County that ask questions about their benefits. Um, also very blessed right now to serve on our Carroll County um, Veterans Advisory Committee where we're helping our commissioners and our state delegates 
learn ways that they can help veterans uh, and the quality of life that they experience here in our county. That is really great. Um, so just going back a little bit, try to get into, it's very serious the things you were involved in, you know, in the military, doing great stuff. You know, I think we all have memories of basic training and school and stuff. Any kind of weird, quirky things stand out, incident that may have happened where you were trying to figure out how to uh, stay out of the drill sergeant's way or, or anything like that? You know, it's funny. I was, I was more of a compliant sailor. I tried to do everything I could for the team and to mm -hmm. help the team. But... Um, I mean, I have sea stories like everybody else, right. but, um, the, you know, what I loved most was transitioning from an enlisted role to an officer role, um, because as a limited duty officer, it's a little bit different as opposed to being someone that came in the military from the Naval Academy or someone that maybe went through officer candidate school. As a limited duty officer, um, you know, we're, 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 we are called what's called Mustangs, and so we have a a very special place in a lot of enlisted people's hearts for helping mentor them and uh, look out for them and to kind of brush away some of the things that you may not necessarily, um, you know, there was a lot of things coming down from the top where I was fortunate where I, I could be that filter and, and kind of um, help shield some of my, um, you know, the team I was leading from some of that kind of stuff that they really didn't need to go through and endure. Right. But, um, and that's why I, I, to this day, have such a special relationship with so many sailors and Marines and Army people that I worked with. I worked with all, all of the services, including Coast Guard. Well, that is, I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, for someone who was an enlisted person, you know, to have an officer who was you and <laughs> understands what you're going through, and I'm sure it's a whole different relationship than... Yeah than folks that just came through the academy. Not that they were all bad or, or whatever, but having somebody who's done the same thing that you had done. Yeah, you and, and also, you know, having been through that enlisted role, um, you, ha you have an idea of the infrastructure, and, and so I was able to get my, my teams more resources for training, and so, you know, you, you weren't that green junior officer, but right. instead you were a seasoned junior officer that could, <clears throat> that could shield your people from the nonsense and also get them the resources they need and empower them to get the job done. All right, that is awesome. That is really, really good. So, um, what's what's ahead for you? What are you What are you looking forward to doing? You know, you know, the older I get, um, it's about it's about keeping it simple. It really is. Um, I, I I have this strong desire to keep serving. Um, I just um, so anything I can do to help our county grow, anything I can do to. Um, you know, to help mentoring young people, whether it's guiding them through the process of going into the military one day, or maybe even going on a on on the uh, on the path to going to college. But I think it's just keeping it simple, focusing on my family, um, and um, making a difference here locally is kind of where I where where I see myself going in the future. All right, that's that's amazing. Um, anything else you want to share the um, before we? No, Grandma, I just, again, or? I appreciate the opportunity and I'm so glad that the Carroll Media Center and you and other colleagues that you work with are, are documenting the stories of our veterans. Um, it's, it's, um, it's much richer to see it in person rather than to read it in a book. And um, again, I just, I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me today. All right, thank you very much. Thank you again, Mr. Whistler, for sharing your memories with us today.